first of all, um, welcome to everybody to this uh, KC Group uh, webinar. And uh, we're delighted to have Professor Frank Larkin with us to talk about his um, Carolink trial. Uh, so without any great ado, I'm going to uh, let Frank introduce himself and give us a presentation. It'll be about 25 oh. minutes. Uh, there's going to be time for questions. Hello, everybody. Um, my thanks, uh, John, for uh, having me on the, at the meeting and uh, to Anne for inviting me and setting things up. Um, I accepted uh, the invitation without any hesitation. Uh, I said to Anne, it doesn't matter what date, uh, because I'm so grateful to, the, to you, the group, for the support that we've had for our trial. So my own um, uh, position, I'm a consultant in Moorfields, uh, have been since 97. So I look after a large number of keratoconus patients uh, with contact lenses, glasses, corneal transplants in particular. And in terms of surgery, corn corneal transplantation is my main, my main thing. Um, Outside Moorfields, I'm involved in a government advisory group called the Ocular Tissue Advisory Group. Uh, and we advise government, or at least a group that I chair, advise government on corneal transplantation across the UK. What that does is give me access to all the trends across the UK and the different involved regions. Uh, and I can get the analysis always pretty well up to date of, for example, the proportion of keratoconus patients who are having transplants and the differences in the different regions of the UK. So that's um, about my kind of professional position. I um, have been chief investigator of the Carolink trial, which John has, um, it's the purpose of my meeting you all this morning. And I'll speak about the organization of that trial and, in fact, the input of the Keratoconus group in the organization of the trial. And um, talk to you, of course, of what we've been doing in the trial and what we have found so far. Um, so um, the Keratoconus trial and a little bit of background to you all on Keratoconus in young patients. And when I say young, I mean up to 16. And the reason why the age 16 is because organization of hospital services for eyes as well as anything else is broadly divided into pediatric and adult. And the age cutoff across the NHS um, and medicine generally is 16 years. So when we planned our trial, we uh, particularly opted to take the age group up to 16, but not beyond, so that the results would fit with the hospital eye services as currently in position uh, across the UK. Now, I don't need to tell members of this group what keratoconus is. It's an abnormality of corneal shape in which there are secondary problems affecting vision. You all know this. The position in terms of treatment of keratoconus, what I would call standard care, uh, is spectacle correction once it's necessary. In some children and adults, it's not because vision is very good in one eye and keratoconus significantly involves only, only one eye. Uh, we move on to contact lens correction when spectacle correction doesn't give good enough acuity for that patient. And when the stage is reached when gas permeable contact lenses don't give good enough vision or can no longer be worn, uh, we switch to uh, corneal transplantation. And that option is discussed and proceeded with if a patient wishes. So the photograph that you see is of one of my own patients uh, post corneal transplant. Now, as you would all probably also know, the more minor procedure of corneal cross-linking has been available in different um, hospital settings and clinic settings, NHS and other, since the late noughties. So more than 10 years, um, probably 12, 13 years. So cross-linking, as currently applied in all age groups, uh, is either in a keratoconus patient before he or she reaches the stage of needing glasses. That's a bit unusual, but we very frequently use cross-linking and advise cross-linking in patients who wear glasses, but in whom you want to prevent the necessity to move to uh, 
optic lens correction. Or sometimes people are wearing lenses, but we could do the cross-linking to hold the vision there so that the vision will remain good with lenses before the patient would need to have a corneal transplant operation with all of the uncertainties that that might involve. So that's the kind of position as things stand across the different age groups, adults and children. You probably all know and also know that, broadly speaking, progression of keratoconus, the gradual worsening of keratoconus and the gradual increase in the abnormality of the shape of the cornea tends to stop at around 30 years of age, very roughly. So late 20s, early 30s. And at that age, there is spontaneous stabilization of keratoconus for reasons which we absolutely cannot understand. But it's a very helpful uh, plateau when a patient gets onto that where there's no further progression. And a patient can understand that he or she should have stable vision with or without lenses or glasses for the rest of, um, rest of life. Now the cross-linking procedure, which this presentation is really about, you will know is generally speaking done with uh, eye drops only. We call that topical anesthetic. Some patients need sedation, particularly our very young patients, just because they're very fidgety. If you've, you've got a young 12-year-old lad uh, on the operating table, I mean, he can keep his head steady, but he's moving his arms, his legs are twitching around all the time. It's not easy for them. And for some of these young patients, we need to give a general anesthetic, put the patient asleep. The procedure involves, first of all, the removal of the very surface layer of the cornea, that's called epithelium. So this is epithelium off cross-linking. And the reason I specify that is there is an, another procedure called epithelium on cross-linking. Now, epithelium off cross-linking means removal of the epithelium. Then in step two, uh, drops called riboflavin are applied to the cornea for 10 minutes. Finally, in step number three, the cornea is uh, exposed to ultraviolet irradiation as shown in the photograph. And you get this kind of green color right on the surface of the cornea. It's a eight millimeter diameter or, or 10 millimeter diameter um, circle. And that's given for eight minutes. And uh, there are some variations in these timings. Following the procedure, the patient put, has, has a contact lens put on the eye, a soft lens for comfort. Uh, the eye is usually very uncomfortable for a day or two. Um, and the procedure is done on one eye or both eyes as necessary. So that's cross-linking um, the procedure and what's involved. Now, epithelium, before I proceed, because I'm going to say hardly anything more about epithelium on cross-linking, except to say it is conceived with the idea being to have a more comfortable eye post-op than an epithelium off cross-linking. The problem is that what evidence we have so far is that it is not effective, or at least it's not as effective as epithelium off cross-linking. So when we approached the government agency who funded our Keralink trial, we were only interested in getting funding for epithelium off cross-linking because we knew from the information in our adult clinics that epithelium off cross-linking was effective, was quite safe, and uh, had been used with nice approval, and there had been randomized controlled trials. So we were asking the question, is this treatment uh, as effective in children or more effective in children than it is in adults? Now, why children? First of all, I've got lots of these young patients in my clinic at Moorfields who are in the pediatric clinic and they've got keratoconus. And the numbers have been building up very steadily over the last uh, 10 years or so. Second, keratoconus, when it starts in very young patients, particularly down near the 10 year old age group, but we see lots of patients in their mid teens when it starts, it tends to be more severe keratoconus than one encounters in adult patients coming for the first time to the clinic at 18 or 20 or 24 years or 28 years of age. And there's lots of evidence from around the world that this is the case. So we know that uh, keratoconus starting off at an early age 
has the risk of progressing fast and causing significant visual uh, loss. Now, this is a 11, an 11 year old, and he came into the clinic as a new patient. The photograph was taken on that day. And you may see on the slide that there is an obvious opacity uh, in the cornea. And this is a scar caused by what's termed acute corneal hydrops. This is seen in keratoconus, uh, in advanced keratoconus. And so this is an example of something you see not infrequently in, in children, much less frequently in adults, of severe vision loss. And as it happens in this 11 year old, the other eye, his left eye, had absolutely normal vision, no glasses, nothing. No signs of keratoconus either. Uh, so that's something we see in the, in the childhood age group that is most unusual in adults. Here's another. This is a photograph of the right eye and the left eye in another 11 year old, not the same patient. You can see in the photograph on the left hand side, this scar right in the center of the cornea, which obviously will have a very big effect on the vision in that eye. In the left eye, six over six vision, perfectly good vision. But in this case, very early signs of keratoconus on an examination done with what's called the pentacam. And that is a device which takes photographs of the cornea, does image analysis, and gives us a contour map of the cornea. Now, this is a slide showing you two pentacam pictures of a patient's right eye on different dates. The green circle that you see filled in on the left and on the right is the contour map of that patient's cornea taken with a pentacam. And in our trial and in follow-up of patients in our clinics all across the UK and around the world now, this examination uh, device uh, is the standard instrument for getting much more detailed measurement of vision or not vision, I should say, but keratoconus and progression of keratoconus. So that's Pentacam. It's a type of what's generally called corneal topography. Now, just to go back, uh, this is a 14 year old's uh, right eye. And in the center of the cornea, you'll see a big white spot, which obviously should not be there. And this is a photograph taken following cross-linking. And the, the white uh, opacity in the center of the cornea is a very, very severe infection of the cornea. So one of the questions that we had before we started our trial was whether serious side effects or complications of cross-linking are more frequent in children than they are in adults. And we have seen a number of patients with problems of this kind following cross linking Not a big number, a small number, but you can appreciate that when that infection is treated and is cured, when there's no longer any infectious bugs in the, in the um, cornea, that leaves a very, very severe scar, a very dense scar, which would severely affect vision long-term. And that eye was a few months later, treated with a corneal transplant. So any possible benefit of the cross-linking procedure in this eye was lost on account of the very severe infection, which was a direct consequence of the cross-linking procedure. Now, going back to uh, corneal topography and pentacam scans, these are scans of a, a, a 16 year old's eye, and the numbers don't matter, but what I want to show you is that with this device, we can take pictures of the same cornea at intervals of three months, six months, or nine months. And we can look at the numbers and these measurements uh, on the contour map, as it were, of the, the altitude of the hill on the cornea. That should not be there. The bulge on the cornea, which is characteristic of keratoconus, has a kind of an altitude. And uh, you can kind of see, looking at the left and the right pictures, that there is much more of a pink area in the center of the corneal map on the right hand side to which I'm pointing. So we get these numerical um, uh, figures here. The, the, these numbers indicate and quantify the amount of bulge. So 49.5 at one examination, 
up to 55.0 29 months later. That is progressive keratoconus. Now, um, when we started our trial in 2016, the position was that community diagnosis of keratoconus, that's always where it starts. Patients going to the optician complaining of poor vision or going to the optician for annual checks and being found for the first time to have keratoconus. So these patients were coming in at younger and younger ages in the years up to 2016. One reason being that some of the high street opticians were themselves buying corneal topography devices, including Pentacam, which is the most expensive. So that was one reason. I don't think keratoconus has become more common in recent years, but our opticians are getting better at diagnosing the disorder. So we needed to do something and we wanted to address these questions in a trial. Is cross-linking effective in young patients? Is it effective as in adults? If it's effective, for how long? And is it safe? NICE guidance in 2013 or 2014 gave approval for the cross-linking procedure in keratoconus in adults. And NICE, which is the government's agency, which examines effectiveness and cost effectiveness of procedures, NICE specifically pointed out that there was no good evidence of effectiveness and safety of keratoconus in children or under 16s. So that was an important justification for doing a properly designed randomized control trial. The second thing is that there was a wide assumption across uh, uh, ophthalmologists around the world that once keratoconus starts off, it doesn't stop progressing until around the age of 30 years. Uh, and uncontrolled studies had been done on cross-linking. When I say uncontrolled, what I mean is cross-linking was done, but there was no comparator group of patients in whom cross-linking was not done. So one could see the effect of cross-linking without any absolute evidence that it was actually a benefit of cross-linking if the keratoconus did not progress, because it might have stopped progressing anyway. Um, so that was something that we realized could be the case. Finally, in the UK, in 2016, certainly, and probably no longer the case, there was very um, disparate availability of cross-linking. And parts of the UK, including Northern Ireland and Wales, but some of the English regions and some of the Scottish regions did not give approval and would not fund cross-linking of the National Health Service because the evidence for its effectiveness was not there. So we knew that if cross-linking was effective and safe, we would need good evidence of the latter, of those two points, before government would be really obliged to roll out cross-linking across the UK without having areas where it was unavailable and then to avoid what was in 2016, a serious case of postcode um, therapeutic availability. And just to show you the buildup in cases from 2012 to 2016 in my own clinic in Moorfields uh, before we had our trial, um, the different colors at the different times along the horizontal axis just refer to different age groups. But most of the patients coming into the clinic were in the ages 14, 15, 16. And we were getting occasional patients as young as um, seven up to 13 or seven up to 10. So we could see the numbers and more really moving up. And we knew the time was coming where we'd have to really do some proper research on this. So the Keraling trial, patients in the Keraling trial were aged 10 to 16. They were uh, randomized to have cross-linking or to have what was called standard care. Standard care was glasses as necessary or contact lenses as necessary for best vision. There was no placebo arm 
So we didn't do anything like, for example, a mock cross-linking procedure where we perhaps removed the epithelium of the cornea, but didn't do the cross-linking. Ethically speaking, that was not an option, quite impossible. There was investigator masking, mean that, meaning that the optometrist who saw the post of patients was not aware whether or not the patient had had cross-linking. And the ophthalmologist looking at the results in the post-op examinations uh, was not aware of the Pentagon results. So the ophthalmologist, like myself, could look at the vision measurements, could look at other things, but we were masked as to the corneal topography or pentacam measurements, which were the primary outcome of the, of the study. The primary outcome means the most important result of the study, the one we were most interested in. But we looked at lots of other things listed in the slide under secondary outcomes, disease progression, did it occur or not, in the two groups, uh, cross-linking and standard care, the duration of time, the interval of time until progression was seen, the visual acuity, of course, the refraction measurement for glasses in that eye, and other things, including quality of life. So the funding was obtained from the National Institute for Health Research, which is the arm of the Department of Health in the UK government, which funds research. So this is taxpayers' money. And the total award for the curling trial, you'll be aghast how much it cost to do this kind of work. A trial with only 60 patients, just a little over a million pounds for uh, follow-up, to including follow-up up to four years after the um, randomization. Very expensive to do these trials. The patients were recruited from Moorfields in London. Most patients were recruited from Moorfields. Also, uh, patients contributed from the Royal Hallamshire in Sheffield, uh, the Royal Eye Hospital at Manchester, and uh, Royal Gwent in Newport. The first patient in the trial entered in October 16, so precisely five years ago, and the last participant went in in September 18, so uh, three years ago. Uh, we've just earlier this year reported the 18-month follow-up uh, data in uh, one of the ophthalmology journals, and I'll show you the results of that at that point uh, in this presentation over the next few minutes. Um, and we have further funding from the National Institute of Health Research to extend the follow-up from 18 months to four years following the um, randomization of patients. So to indicate the first patient who was randomized in October 2016 was at the four-year point in October 2020. So he has left the trial and we've got four-year follow-up data on that particular um, young patient. So we'll, be, we'll keep working uh, until late 2022 with the results. Okay, now this is a complicated picture and it's the flow chart of the trial. Now up at the very top, you can see that we screened 240 patients in order that we got to the necessary number of patients that our statisticians worked out in advance would need to be 60 patients. And there were 30 patients randomized to have the cross-linking uh, operation, and 30 patients were randomized to have the standard care and not cross-linking. Now, a clinical trial of this kind is uh, tricky for a number of reasons. We can't have a placebo arm in the study. I explained that to you. Another point is that we were largely seeking in almost all cases, permission from parents rather than patients. And a lot of parents we anticipated would want to know what would happen and what would we do in the event that their uh, child was randomized to standard care and not cross-linking. And in the course of the trial, it was found that there was significant progression affecting vision. Would we offer the cross-linking? In other words, take the patient out of the trial. So in the trial design, we incorporated what we call crossover. 
In other words, that according to the protocol of the trial, if there were signs of significant pressure progression in a patient in the standard care arm, that patient and parents would be offered uh, a switch over to the cross-linking arm of the trial. So we built that in for sound ethical reasons and also to give parents assurance that what we would uh, recommend would always be in the best interests of the participant in the trial, i.e. Their, their child, their son or daughter. So that's crossover just to explain uh, about the ethics of the trial. And then we did our analysis at 18 months. We will be doing a further analysis at four years. This slide, please don't look at all the numbers, but I've put it up here just to remind myself to, to tell you just what a high proportion of our young patients were of Asian or what's termed Asian British ethnicity. Of the 30 in the cross-linking group, 10 were Asian or Asian British. These are all South Asian. So that is ethnicity, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, uh, Sri Lankan, those um, groups. And, and also a high proportion of the standard care group. So 27 of the 60 patients in the trial were of Asian ethnicity. This is really important. And of course, that's far higher in proportion than the proportion of Asian citizens in the UK by population. So keratoconus is a disease, at least in the young, which has a very, very much higher proportion impact in that ethnic group. Now, results. First of all, I said to you that the main result we were interested in the trial was the number uh, marking progression on the uh, topography pentacam scan. So in this uh, graph, along the bottom is baseline, and then time in months three, six, nine, 12, 15, and 18. So the patients were examined every three months following the time that they were randomized to either have cross-linking or to have standard care. Uh, in blue is the, the topography measurement in the cross-linking group. And it's broadly the same at around 49, you can see there, going from baseline to 18 months. In contrast, you'll see that those who received standard care and not cross-linking, there was a steady increase in that number from baseline up to 18 months. And there was a significant difference between the two groups at 18 months. So this is evidence that there was progression of keratoconus overall in the standard care group that was not seen in the cross-linking group. More detailed breakdown I'll talk to you about in a moment, but that was the key finding in the study. Visual acuity on the left, uncorrected vision, that means without glasses, without contact lenses, just with the naked eye. And on the right, what's termed best corrected vision, using the optimum spectacle or contact lens as required for vision in the study eye. Now, in each of the two graphs, you can see that the orange line of the standard care group goes upwards, and the blue line of the cross-linking group stays the same or goes slightly down. So more evidence that the cross-linking did seem to have a benefit in terms of vision in the 18 months following the randomization. Very few figures in this graph, I've taken most of them out, but just to show you the difference between the two groups in the number that did have progression after the randomization. So 30 patients were randomized to cross-linking. And in the 18-month period post cross-linking, only two had progression by 18 months. So 28 did not. In the standard care group, we had 18-month information on 28 patients. And at 18 months, progression of keratoconus had been found in 12 of those patients. That's 42, for nearly 43%, as opposed to under 7% in the cross-linking group. More evidence 
that cross-linking seem to be effective in stopping progression. Now, I don't know if any of you work in the insurance industry, but um, this is a way of showing uh, data called actuarial survival. So this way of showing figures is used by actuaries, so the, the kind of mathematic kind of guys who work in the insurance business. And it shows a difference between two lines that you'll see here on the graph. But what I want to just explain is that in, in the insurance industry, the actuary will be looking at time zero. Say he's looking at life expectancy. Uh, everybody's born, so it's 100% at time zero at birth, and then gradually people die. So by the age of 100, most people are dead. Uh, by the age of 110, pretty well everyone is dead. Uh, but by 50, most people are still alive. Broadly speaking, that's what the actuaries are kind of looking at and why they're looking at life expectancy. So here we're looking at it is by the same methodology at progression of keratoconus. So on top is the uh, cross-linking uh, group. You will see that one patient there at uh, six months and one patient here at about nine months had signs of progression. So at that stage, there were the two patients and all the others stayed the same right up to 18 months. But look at the other group. People were getting progression all the time and the, the blue line was going lower and lower. By 18 months, around, uh, how I told you, 12 of the 28 patients had progression of keratoconus. So you can see the kind of spread and the, the increasing gap between the two eyes and between the two groups, I should say, as time passes uh, from the beginning of the trial. So um, at 18 months, we've got a significant uh, result. The trial itself is the first uh, randomized controlled trial in children to compare non-treated with treated patients. The trial has confirmed at 18 months, within 18 months, effect, efficacy and effectiveness and also safety. We found it was very safe in 10 to 16 year olds and they all had progressive keratoconus when they entered the trial. The significance also is that I don't think it will be possible anywhere again in the future to set up a clinical trial of keratoconus in which you do not offer cross-linking. In other words, I don't think it would be ethically acceptable anymore for standard care to be one arm of a trial, such as the impact of cross-linking that we have found in our trial. Now, what ophthalmologists uh, will want to know is, should it be that cross-linking is offered on day one when a child comes with keratoconus, in other words, at the time of diagnosis, rather than following up that child to look to see whether the disease is continuing to progress? What we found is that progression took place in 12 of the 28 patients with standard care, but it did not take, uh, occur in 16 of those 28 patients, up to 18 months. So uh, it's not the case necessarily that keratoconus remorselessly progresses in these young patients once it starts. They seem to stabilize and get onto a plateau, maybe to increase at a later time, we don't know. But that's one of the reasons why we think it important to continue with the patients who are in the trial. Cross-linking was very safe in all of our patients who were treated with cross-linking in our trial. But I've shown you photographs, and there are there is a steady uh, but, but small flow of patients coming in from around the country uh, of young patients who have problems caused at cross-linking or by cross-linking. So I would say, in answer to the question, should cross-linking provoke a diagnosis? First of all, we didn't directly address this question in the trial because we waited for confirmed progression before we admitted patients to the trial. But I remain personally of the opinion that we shouldn't do cross-linking at diagnosis, but wait until we see further progression. Should the interval for a decision to do cross-linking be different in children 
given the greater risk of progression than in adults. I don't think there's evidence of that. In other words, I think as in adults, we should wait until we see progression and then consider or offer cross-linking. But what I do think is that we should be examining these children quite frequently in the clinics, maybe every three months in case there is progression. And we don't do that in adults. We examine the patients every six months in the clinics. So I think more frequent uh, follow-up, shorter intervals, so that we can spot changes. So now just to sum up, sum up for you, generally in keratoconus in young patients, what are the problems caring for these patients that we don't have in adults? First of all, some of the younger uh, patients don't find it easy to cooperate with the topography. They can't keep looking at the target, they're moving their head. It's just difficult for them to cooperate when they're young and they're fidgety. Another problem is that these young patients find, I mean, everybody finds rigid lens wear difficult at the beginning, but it's particularly difficult getting young patients started with uh, contact lens wear. And it's very trying and it's very difficult for their parents. I've already said to you that there can be quite rapid progression of keratoconus in some eyes. I've shown you photographs of patients with very severe keratoconus, very severely affecting vision in one eye at the very first clinic appointment. You just don't see that too often in adults. I've said to you that cross-linking can require a full general anesthetic, which is most rare in adults. Of great significance is parental anxiety at diagnosis. And I think this is where the, um, the KC group really, I think, can be helpful. Many of these parents, when they, before they come into the clinic, they're looking up keratoconus, they're afraid of blinding disease in their children. At the clinic, they're asking questions about, you know, will he or she be able to drive? They're worried about education. Uh, it's a big issue. And one of the key obligations, I think, as an ophthalmologist, is to explain to these parents, to allay their anxieties, to point out that keratoconus is very rarely a blinding disease and that we do have treatments that keep vision good. So you all know this, but parents of our keratoconus young patients, they don't know this. So parental anxiety, and I think we need to get these parents uh, in communication with your group um, on day one. I think that would be a very positive kind of thing. And I hope you will be able to take these parents in and reach out to them. Finally, and of quite a lot of importance in my own view, is the much higher prevalence of keratoconus in Down syndrome. So we did not recruit Down syndrome young patients in our trial because keratoconus can progress in a very different way in Down syndrome to, parent, to uh, young patients who do not have but I think we need to look at this particular group in whom there are huge challenges um, and cross-linking may have a very helpful role in Down syndrome. Um, I finish with my thanks, first of all, to the NIHR, that's the government agency who have paid all that money to help us do the trial. Uh, Moorfield's Eye Charity in my own institution has been great. The Pentacam machine is shown in the photograph. That's 56,000 pounds. Very, very expensive. The group to whom I'm addressing this morning, notably Anne Klepaz, uh, who was involved in the curling trial even before it began in design, helping us with the, the um, explanations, helping us writing the proposal, um, writing it for NIHR and the lay uh, members of NIHR, and Mike Oliver also. Uh, so Anne has been sitting on a trial management group from the beginning, and Mike on our curling trial steering committee. So particular thanks to both Anne and Mike, but more generally to your group. And thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you, Frank. If you'd like to sh stop sharing your screen. We'll, um, we'll do, a, we'll, we'll, we'll do a, a thanks at the end. But uh, I mean, that was absolutely fascinating, uh, certainly from my point of view. Um, and it never ceases to amaze me how many things you can learn just about the standard condition that you didn't know before. And in particular, the one that hit me was your comment um, 
that we don't know why you can get this spontaneous natural cross linking uh, you yeah. know at, at some middle age um i hadn't realized that uh, that that was still a big unknown i thought it was just felt that was just part of the natural aging process but that's not really part of the carolink trial i know no but it's 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 it's, it's a it's telling us something and i don't know what it's telling us yeah fascinating, <laughs> fascinating. or do we for that matter john nor do we really know how cross-linking works and people like keith meek who's doing fantastic work yeah. on this for many years in cardiff he's the he's the international beacon on research on what we call the biophysics of the cornea right. keith can't explain how cross there isn't cross-linking he's looked with electron microtic cross-linking doesn't call the procedure doesn't actually cause cross-linking it works by some other means. So there are lots of unresolved questions, but I'm a pragmatist, uh, John. Yeah. And, you know, if it works, the first yeah. thing is to make sure it's available. A absolutely. And, and part of making it available is to give good evidence to government. Yeah. And it's probably yeah. the same around the world. But the, we have to start where we're working, which is in the UK. Anyway, I'd like to throw it open to, uh, to, to general questions. Frank's kindly agreed to stay on for a bit. You referred to keratoconus at stage four. What, what does stage four mean, please? Stage four, I don't think I referred to the stages, uh, Sandra, but the stage four is, um, the stages one to four refer, it's an old classification of keratoconus severity, which has been a bit um, superseded by the topography, quantitative mathematical information, which give us the numbers. Uh, and the old stages of keratoconus really referred to the amount of uh, bulge of the cornea in a very crude way. And stage four was the top, uh, the most severe uh, keratoconus. Okay, thanks. And stage one was um, generally corresponded to quite mild keratoconus in which spectacle corrected vision was good and contact lenses were not necessary. But we don't, we don't use the staging uh, anymore because we've got such accurate numbers uh, from the tomography. And the machines are so widely available, we've all stopped using the staging. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. S Stephanie, good to hear you. Can't see you, but um, you've got your hand up. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, and thank you, Professor Larkin, for such a great presentation. I've been making loads of notes because we've just got um, cross-linking approved in Wales and uh, in particular want to develop a stream for kids and for people who have Down syndrome. So if you don't mind, I'd love to follow up and get your um, opinion, you know, on how we make sure that that um, that they're dealt with. So it's really good, you know, to hear about the three months. So I'll make sure that we include that in our protocol. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind, about... Um, atopian allergy and, and whether there was anything within that uh you know within the children's population that any advice you have uh, was there anything that came up or perhaps that wasn't included in the study we, but thank we, you it, it, uh, thank you stephanie we've met before stephanie i'm pretty sure um, yes we have yes and thank in, you. in i think at the arvo meeting uh now uh, stephanie we did we did a secondary analysis it wasn't one of our protocol our predetermined um, endpoints but we did do a analysis of the young patients who were atopic in other words had severe allergic disease versus those who had no allergic problems and we didn't find a difference that surprised me but we didn't now i would i would caution uh, by saying that the study wasn't set up to look at the influence of allergy on keratoconus severity and keratoconus progression and the effectiveness of cross linking in allergy versus no allergy. But we didn't see a, um, a difference between the groups. And as I say, it may be that we actually need a trial with you know two or 300 patients rather than just 60 and two groups of 30. But we didn't see it in our small trial, we didn't find a difference. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and perhaps if you don't mind, may I follow up with you afterwards about um, you know, just, um, you know, get, getting the general atopia advice, you know, as we set up this cross linking service in yeah. Wales, um, because I want to make sure that um, we can put forward to the NHS and the government, you know, a holistic yeah. approach. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, whilst I'm on the subject, I'm going to ask, you know, uh, for, you know, a follow up with the um, wonderful people on the um keratoconus support group as well because we, we really want to drive this with patient-led yeah. opinions uh, as well as professional uh, so um, advance yeah. warning to everybody <laughs> thank you uh, Frank as a follow-on to that did you ask the children parents about eye rubbing uh, no it's 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 uh, eye doctors optometrists uh, patients they all hear about it all think about rubbing and you know there's 
anecdotally, it's thought to be quite important in, in making keratoconus worse. And it's one of the reasons why, just going back to the question just, just earlier, why there, there is a perceived link of allergic disease with itchy eyes and keratoconus. But it's very hard to quantify it, uh, John. And it's very, if, 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 if a child or parent says, no, it never rubs the eyes or rubs the eyes, you know, it, is that just rubbing once a day? Is it rubbing constantly? Um, you know, it's very soft and it's a difficult kind of parameter to mm. do good research on. So we did that one and we didn't really look at the rubbing or no okay. rubbing. Okay, yep. uh, okay, Olivia, if you'd like to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if um, you were saying about Asian backgrounds um, and pediatric patients. So my daughter is um, mixed white um, Asian, but she was she also had ROP um, due to being born premature. I was wondering if there was any correlation. I can't really find an awful lot. I've got keratoconus and if there's any, is she more likely to get it due to that? Or is there any link? What do you mean with retinopathy prematurity? Yeah, whether she had, is there any greater yeah. chance or and is there you know uh, um olivia i can't actually think of a single keratoconus patient young or old who under my care who has rop um there is a well recognized link of retinopathy prematurity with refractive errors particularly myopia as you may yeah. know yeah. so your child may have myopia if a keratoconus has been confirmed well that's unarguable but it's not an association that I'm aware of, either personally or in reports, you know, in professional journals. So yes. I think it's a one-off, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anybody else got any questions? Um, Professor Larkin, thank you very, very much and also uh, for doing that and also for everyone for organizing it. it it's brilliant. Um, our kid is a 70 year old, just had cross-linking in one eye and we're told that he's got very slight KC in the other eye. How likely is it on the second eye to progress, do you think? Um, I can't give you a, pro a kind of a, you know, proven answer or an answer no. generated from any data. Um, we are in our own trial, uh, James, following up the two eyes. We, we have what we call the study eye and the non-study eye. The study eye was the, the more severely involved eye. Yeah. But we're following up both. And with four-year follow-up information, I think we'd be we'd have, even though our numbers in the study are small, uh, we would have a good enough long-term kind of natural history picture of the two eyes. So I think if I was asked that question in four years, I could probably give an answer that I can't really give now. Um, obviously, and pragmatically, one has to just follow up the second eye. And yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that's being done and it will need to be continued until, as I say, you know, end of the, thir end of the uh, 20s. So you'll have to wait and see, but uh, I, I, I'll, um, I must remember to make sure we address that question when we're looking at our four-year uh, results. Thanks. And <clears throat> what idea has been to do epi on, on the lesser eye, just as sort of preemptive thing, doesn't do much harm, why not do it sort of thing? And I, I can't really see any studies on how effective epi on is or not. Yes. I think the reason is, John, that it's not effective and people are kind of doing it without any, any evidence. I, I feel quite unhappy about it. And uh, uh, I, just as I think it is no longer feasible to offer or to, to propose to patients a trial in which standard care is given, I think so scant is the evidence that epithelium on cross-linking actually works that I don't think you could ethically propose a trial of epithelium off versus epithelium on. I, I, we would all predict the results hands down, epithelium off would win. I think the, the, the one way forward is that we've got much better with the help of our anesthetists in Moorfields at managing post-op discomfort in uh, cross-linking, which is a big issue for parents whose children have cross-linking. Yeah. And, um, you know, much more, uh, much better advice, stronger oral analgesia, uh, pain-killing medication. Mm -hmm. So I think the attractiveness of epithelium on uh, kind of is because it's less painful. But if you've got good medications that carry, carry the patient through for 24, 48 hours, I don't think there's any need to get involved in a, in a kind of, you know, doubtfully effective procedure uh, to avoid pain. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dan. If I were a parent, I mean, I'd say, no, no, thanks. I wouldn't. I, I, I'll, I'll wait and see is what I would say if I were you. I okay. wouldn't go for epithelium on. 
Great. Thanks very much. Okay, anybody else? Shout now. Well, Frank, um, I, I think, um, well, well, what can we say? That was beautifully clear presentation, absolutely fascinating. And uh, I think we all are very grateful for people like you who are you know, tr trying to help us all in, in, in such a positive way. Um, I, I'm sure we'd love to have you back when you've got your four year uh, uh, results in 2022. Put um, me a note. <laughs> great interest. Yes, we'll book you in now. Could I ask everybody to uh, unmute themselves, please? And um, I, I think we'd all like to uh, share our appreciation with a, a round of applause. So thank you, Frank. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Uh, David, do you want to uh, yeah. make any closing comments? I'm going to put the application form for the corneal day on the website um later on today so if anyone wants to do you want, did you say about the corneal day frank i will now david if you'll allow me so the what so, david's referring to is we've got a keratoconus patient day uh on the saturday the 27th of november uh in central london it's in um university college london ucl very close to euston station uh gower street uh it runs from 10.30 to, I think, 4 o'clock with lunch, all provided at no charge. Um, and we will have a selection of presentations from myself, other people involved in Carolink, those involved in uh, adult keratoconus uh, care. Um, and I'm hoping to have a, a youngster and parent from the Carolink trial also um, presenting, speaking. And one of the things we do want to uh, do is get the opinion of patients, particularly your group, on research that you think should be given highest priority going forward. So even if you can't come into London for that uh, patient day on the 27th of November, um, I, I, it would be great if maybe somebody, some people from the group who I'm hoping will be able to attend might even just uh, kind of canvas opinions. And maybe you could do this during your meeting later today or by email. But thank you, David, if you can flag it up in your newsletter or on your website. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible uh, in the flesh, face to face. Yeah, we've just got a question in from Olivia on the chat saying, can we join via Zoom if we can't get into London? Is that likely to be a possibility? I think uh, it's being recorded. Um, John, I don't know whether, you know, we're not going to be doing a, a kind of hybrid where it's it's just so very, very expensive to mm. set up a hybrid Zoom plus face-to-face. -face. But I do believe we'll be recording the proceedings. Okay. Um, so that, too, but um, no, we will, if, if you can get into London, that's the very best way. But as I say, if people can come in, uh, if they do have views on the future and what the unresolved questions are, and we've been hearing and discussing about some of them, the questioning just after my presentation this morning. I mean, we'd be very keen just to have those suggestions from you and colleagues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any Anybody else want to say anything before we, we close down? It's Elaine, I want to ho hold up a KC mug. But yes, that's... indeed, sorry. Yes, just to say, um, KC mugs, <laughs> plenty available. Just contact David or Anne or even John if, um, if you'd like one. They can be one, one or two or however many you want can be posted out to you. And also Casey T-shirts. Yeah. yeah. So, again, we, they come in medium and large. I'm actually wearing a medium, so you've got an idea of um, size. So, um, but if you want one, as I say, just contact Anne, David, Gable or John and they will pass on the information to yeah, me and, and I will post one out to you. And the prices are? Well, a, a donation. A donation. So if you just ask for a donation. So you can sort that out. You can donate through the website or send a check or, or whatever. So that's how we do that. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, especially to, to, to you, Frank. A a absolutely terrific. Uh, and we're very grateful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll bye close bye. there and say goodbye to everybody. Uh, but many thanks again.